And welcome to Fat Kings Friday for February 6th. I'm Andrew, VSG Spike. And I am a VSG Warrior, VSG Walter. And uh, normally I would ask you what is on the menu tonight, Andrew, but tonight we have a special dish. We have that our we first do. guest. Yes, it is, it is the lovely and talented Mr. Jim Haney. And uh, we are very excited to have him. Jim, why don't you uh, take it from here? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, thanks. Uh, it's uh, great to be on the show. Um, I watch you guys all the time. Uh, I am Jim. I've had my VSG surgery a little over five years ago. Actually, let me read the stats I got right here. Um, so 65.25 months ago, or 276 weeks ago. Um, wow. I know you guys like to do the, the weekly updates, but, you know, <laughs> after, about, after about 250 of the weeks, you're, you kind of, like, stop keep keeping track. At they all blur. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, five and a half years out, um, I, it was the best thing I've ever done. Um, I was I started out about three weeks before my surgery with my pre-op diet. I had, I had a little over 600 pounds. Um, I had my surgery at 580. Um, took me about 22 months to get to my goal weight, basically, which was 250. So I lost 350 pounds or so in about 22 months. Holy um, shit! <laughs> and been pretty much maintaining that um, up until about two years ago. Um, I've had four foot surgeries here in um, the past two years, uh, just kind of one surgery after another. So I really have been very inactive for the past 18 months to two years. And, you know, so I've put on about another 20 pounds. So I'm currently holding at about 270, though. So I'm still pretty happy and not too worried about getting it back off again when I um, become active again. No, that's all. Awesome. Still being at 270 for all after all this yeah. time and having the surgeries and everything else. I mean, hell, you still can't beat that. That's awesome, man. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can imagine that... Uh, if I didn't have the sleeve or, you know, my, my surgery, I probably would have easily put on 100 pounds in the past two years because I just haven't been sitting around. There's boredom meeting. There's basically no activity. I'm supposed, I'm supposed to be pretty much sitting with my foot elevated the whole time. So it could be worse, you know. No, no. Sure. you'd be extremely proud. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was um, you had uh, – so you had the sleeve surgery over five years ago. Right. And – I think you had told me that your surgeon was one of the pioneers of the sleeve, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I was, when I was looking at, I've been looking at bariatric surgery for probably about seven years. <clears throat> and the, uh, really the only options at the time were the bypass um, and the band. I didn't even know what the sleeve was, and I didn't know what the DS was. Um, after seeing my doctor's seminar, you know, I went and saw him. One of the first seminars I went and saw he explained all four surgeries because he does all four surgeries. And then I was like, okay, well, that one sounds appealing to me. Um, but unfortunately, most insurance companies at that time, so we're talking probably six years ago, actually seven years ago because I, was, I started actually trying to get approved almost two years before I actually had the surgery. Um, most insurance companies didn't cover the sleeve. It was experimental. A lot of companies or uh, insurance companies were like, uh, we don't even know what that is. It's not an approved procedure blah, blah, blah. So they gave you basically two choices, um, which were the bypass and the van. Um, my, a lot of doctors basically told me, and at that time I was probably 500-ish pounds. Most doctors, when I went in looking at, uh, into surgery um, with a van, they basically told me, uh, you're too big for the van. <laughs> you know, you're not going to lose, lose enough weight, which was true, you know. This van's really not designed for people that are super morbidly obese. Um, so after getting finally fighting with insurance for about two years, I actually had to wait to sign up again with my work, my job through um, wait till the following year to actually change insurance companies. Um, then it was another year process basically to get approved. And I had my surgery with my doctor who, like I said, was uh, basically a pioneer of the uh, sleeve surgery. He's probably been doing it for 15 years now. And at the time he had already done over a thousand, so back wow. in 2009. Um, but uh, yeah, so I was like, I was lucky to be in the California Bay Area. Um, I'm currently living in Georgia. Um, I 
moved out here to be with my wife. Um, but yeah, I was real lucky. I mean, he was an hour from me. He was in, he's in San Francisco. And so I was actually lucky because I talked to probably five bariatric surgeons. And most of them basically looked at me at 500 pounds um, at that time in probably 2006, 2007. Mm -hmm. basically said, we want you to lose 150 pounds minimum before we'll even touch you. And I was like, okay, well, you know, if I could lose a lot of weight pretty easily, I probably wouldn't need bariatric surgery, number one. But, you know, it was just, it's just a high risk. You're high risk anytime your BMI is over 50 or 60. And mine sure. was. Sure. How, how, many pounds, how many pounds did you lose pre-op? Uh, well, actually, let me ask you. Uh, only, only about 20. Did you have a six-month waiting period, or did you just... No, I didn't. I did okay. not. Um, by the time I got approved, um, I got the approval letter, and my doctor um, got the approval letter. He said, because he knew I'd been doing this process for almost two years, I actually um, put in the paperwork with a different insurance company to try to get my doctor, you know, um, to get it approved through them. And that was denied, denied, denied. And so that's when I had to basically go back and sign up with a different insurance company who finally got it approved through them. Um, so basically my doctor knew, you know, I had dieted for a year and a half before that. I had started the diet, lost 30, 40 pounds, basically hit all these road bumps, and I just kind of gave up and said, well, you know, fuck it, I'm not going to get the surgery now. Went back up to my normal weight, which was at that time probably 600-ish pounds. Um, and so it was a really a long process for me. But when I finally did get approved, my doctors were like, you know, he was honestly, he was like concerned that at that size, size and all the health problems I had, I had diabetes. I was on 250 units of insulin a day. I had sleep apnea. I had high blood pressure. I had high cholesterol. I had hypothyroidism. I had back problems and knee problems. I was walking with a cane. And I think he honestly thought, we need to get you in as soon as possible so you don't have some sort of major health complication and then you won't be able to qualify for the surgery. So he, within three weeks of the actual getting the approval, I, I went in for surgery. So oh, I had lost shit. <clears throat> he said, he basically said, he's like, he didn't require like a pre-op diet. He didn't require me to lose a certain amount of weight. He basically said, do low carb, um, high protein. You lose what you lose and, you know, hopefully, um, you know, he just wants you to shrink, you know, the, the liver to shrink a little. He says, but I really want you to get it, get you in as soon as possible. I know you've waited for, you know, almost two years at this point. And so they got me in within three weeks. And I probably lost, I'm guessing, I, I must have lost by a little over 20 pounds in that three weeks because, I was like I said, at, at, you know, they weigh you at, right before you get on the operating table. I was 580. Well, first off, I just have to say how, you know, it's very rare that Andrew and I will feel like lightweights in anyone's company. <laughs> right. I was 500 yeah. pounds. Andrew was 480 something. I mean, so yeah. we're you know we're used to looking down on lightweights. Yeah, and now we are. Guys. So yeah. just, we are not worthy. We are not worthy. <laughs> you are uh, you are the King Kahuna. Yeah. 600 yeah. pounds is no well, joke. You got to start somewhere, you know. And uh, hey, I mean, but it's, unfortunately, it's, where I started from was a lot heavier than a lot of people start, you know. Sure, but, sure. But that's why I started making the videos too because I'm like, you know what? When you hit a certain point, your story becomes much much more intriguing, I think. You know, it's like, holy yeah. shit. Because we we have such a bigger hill to climb. We have such a bigger, longer struggle than, you know, someone who only has to lose 100 pounds. I mean, Exactly. I'm, I mean, I'm but I, I don't want to say, yeah, I don't want to exactly. say only 100 pounds because, you know, that's amazing. And that's, it's sure. It sure is. Own, but, own set of problems. But, but it's just, to me, it's just a longer journey. You know, that's all it is. But, it's, but, it, but it is just, and, and you know, if you, if, you, if you lost 100 pounds, now think about having to do that two more times. Exactly. You know, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's, I'm not belittling anybody's journey, but oh, it just, yes. it's just... Absolutely not. Absolutely yeah. not. I mean, you know, most of my friends, because a lot of my friends, then they started out, I have lots of friends that are, you know, weight loss surgery patients also. Um, when we first started out, I told them it was kind of like, you know, I used to complain, and, you know, when you're, when you're actively losing for almost two years, you know, it's a lot different than... I have friends that got to gold in six months. I have friends that got to gold within a year. Most of my friends, by the time a year was out, they were already at goal, and some of them lost significant amounts of weight, you know, 150, 200 pounds. And I was like, man, I said, you know, I feel like 
we've been on this journey, like to go someplace, like you know, hey, it's spring break, we're all going to fucking Jamaica, right? Um, well, here it is, you know, we're all traveling at the same time. We we take different planes, you know, and you guys have all gone there, and I see you guys, you know, posting on Facebook or you partying on the beach and everything. I said, and here I am stuck in fucking Podunk, Idaho, somewhere. <laughs> Still, you know, because I'm still, I'm not there yet. You know, when they're already on that goal, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and all these clothes fit me now. I got these, went out and shopping and bought all new clothes and stuff, you know. So it's kind of like, you kind of feel like that, you know. It's like, I still have so much further to go. I still got 150 pounds to lose, you know. I said, and, you know, I'm not getting there anytime soon when all these other people are already at goal and, like, have been for a year, you know. So it does suck in that sense, I guess, but. But, but ultimately, I mean, maintenance becomes its own struggle for everyone anyway so you know we yeah. all become, we all get we eventually we all get to spring break and then you know, <laughs> exactly <laughs> and start partying so like Andrew, I'm sorry I'm, I'm taking over the show just because I'm so excited to have Jim here no and, I don't blame you I, I, I certainly understand makes sense because I mean it's it's great because I, I mean I, I knew I knew of and about Jim but I didn't know completely the entire story so I mean I'm kind of learning along with you and along with a lot of the viewers because it's I mean I mean he you know what what he's echoing is similar to how I often feel myself in my own situation where you know being a bigger guy and still trying to lose and you know I, I've I've admittedly been losing a little slower these past couple of months but I, I it doesn't bother me because I know I'm still losing I you know there may be other people who are taking you know to use the the spring break metaphor who they may be taking the jumbo jet already you know hightailing it to Jamaica but I'll be sitting in a little dinghy with the Evan route <laughs> but I'm still getting there exactly yeah it's just, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just patience, man. You gotta wait. Jim has a special place in, in, in my my journey too, because um, it was kind of early on, and uh, this was before my father had passed, and 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 my family was kind of they were on the fence, you know, they weren't saying it, but they you could tell, like whenever I talked about it, they were like, well, well, they actually did say it a couple of times. I, I wish you could do it on your own, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, try to. <laughs> try to you know let them know you know how many times have you seen me do it and and then and then fail you know how many times yeah, have I definitely. you know been crying on your shoulder or so and then I and then Jim actually reached out to one of my videos and he and he and he told me his story and I was just so overwhelmed by it I actually sat down and told my mother you know like this you know this 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 is somebody who was was had a, an enormous amount of weight to lose and has kept it off. And and those that's the key. I mean, because losing weight is is doable. Keeping it off, that's the tricky part. Oh yeah. So yep. getting to that, why don't we, why don't you talk a little bit about um, your struggles with maintenance and regain and how you how you going with that? Okay. For some of the viewers who might be you know long term you know who are out for a long oh, time. Well, look, let me show you my shirt. Sure. Nice. There you go. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Hey, uh, before you jump into that, too, anybody who's watching, if you want to comment, leave any questions. Uh, well, we've, we've got some questions that came up on Facebook. We'll field questions as well, so if you have any questions for Jim, keep them, keep them uh, right, you know, uh, send them in, and we'll keep watching and pass them along for sure. Yeah, so um, maintenance, honestly, um, once I got to my goal, you know, it was like just kind of like maintaining. Um, I honestly did not find it that difficult. Um, I think because for those two years, I really just kind of changed my relationship with food. I changed um, how I thought about food, what I was eating, my lifestyle, you know, was exercising and working out on a regular basis. Um, so I didn't really struggle, honestly, with any weight gain or any issues with re regain until, like I said, I really became sort of inactive because of these uh, latest health problems with my foot. Um, I will say um, it did happen probably, so I guess three and a half years out. And I know there's some other people out there, uh, Tanya and uh, Chris Waffle have mentioned, like when they hit like the three, three and a half year mark, it was like a struggle and they found it harder to take weight off. Now that I can attest to. I mean, you know, if I go low cal now and try to do it, it's definitely harder to lose the weight once you've gained some weight back, you know. Um, so... There's definitely a time, I think, where your body kind of adjusts to what you're eating calorically. And um, there's 
so many other things that factor into why it's so much easier to lose weight before um, as you're losing, especially the losing phase, you know, they call it the honeymoon phase, you know, that's a reality, it does exist. Um, it happens because you have super restriction, it happens because um, you're very highly motivated, you know, when you're losing weight and you see those, the loss and you see, you know, all these NSVs and things, you're extremely motivated for that first year or two. Um, and those all contribute to why I think the weight loss at least seems a little easier, you know, and it is at least for the first six months to a year um, with sleevers. And the bypass, it's a little different because the malabsorption component with a bypass ends at about 18 months. So they have their own issue with why the weight loss seems easier at first and then it's maybe a little tougher after a year or two. Um, but like I said, I honestly haven't had a ton of regain. I mean, 20 pounds to me in four years or whatever isn't, you know, isn't a huge issue. And I think I know... Pretty much, I mean, I, honestly, this past three or four months, I had been horrible as far as diet-wise. Um, I recently got married, uh, honeymoon, the holidays, everything, and my wife and I have both been eating a lot of junk. Um, so that's contributed to it, obviously. And um, it's real easy once you're three years out, you know, four years out, even two years out, to kind of go back to eating um, junk and kind of doing things that you probably shouldn't be doing, you know. Um, and it's easy. I mean, and if you don't reel it in, it can, it can take a hold of your, your, you know, your success. So, um, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not a person that um, advocates or um, is a, like a, you know, you have to go hardcore all the time with, you know, with your eating. And I'm a very much a proponent of um, moderation. Um, I think, you know, if you want to eat chips or a donut on occasion, you know, that's your choice. It, you're not a person who has issues with moderating your diet or you're not a, an addictive person when it comes to carbohydrates or something and you can control that, then I don't see anything wrong with, you know, eating off plan, I call it, on occasion. Um, the same thing with alcohol and drinking, you know. Um, I drink on occasion um, and there are some people who just can't do that though. They, if they have a cookie or a donut, they're going to eat the whole, you know, they're going to eat a dozen of them. And that's, you know, something that people had to work out for themselves and sort of figure that out later on. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's definitely harder, I think, to sort of maintain this and sort of keep this lifestyle going the further out you get. Because the further out you get, the further out you get from the original feelings and the original restriction and the original high of losing all this weight and losing it quickly. Um, and you kind of like go back to living life again. I mean, some people, you know, I think you guys have talked about people, you know, they enter the community and then they're, they're gone. You know, they're not on you know, Facebook or YouTube anymore. They don't participate in things anymore. And I think it's because, you know, for the most part, I think uh, people are out living life. You know, they're out enjoying life. They're kind of like trying to get back to a normal thing where, weight loss and weight loss surgery and the diet and the exercise isn't the main focus of their life, life anymore, you know. And, you know, they go back to work and they go back to hanging out with friends and family and doing things. And so when you do that, if, if, you're, not, if you're not sort of aware of what your situation is and how to keep from going back into old habits, sometimes bad habits can creep back in. You know, for some people, they stay in and they can't get back on track, you know, so... It's not easy, but it's doable. I think it, I think it also depends on where you mm -hmm. are, and, you know, in the journey as well. I mean, I think for us who are lifetime fatties and, and uh, you know, we, and we're in the honeymoon phase, the idea, like, we cringe when we hear you say, if you want the cookie, have the cookie, because we're, like, so fucking focused and gung-ho, and we're like, yeah, I could never, I can't have a cookie, I'll, I'll fucking lose it all. You know, like, you, you're just so worried about failure that, you know, but I can see where once once you get to maintenance or you're getting closer to goal. I mean, even 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 now, I mean, if I if I had a cookie, the sky's not going to fucking fall. I get that. Right. You know, but I think to some people, a little bit more nervous. But when you mention alcohol, and I just want to give a shout out to all the people in New Orleans, because we got a lot of people out there, and the Queen Voodoo herself is out there. Um, so have fun, guys. I know there will be oh, yeah. some alcoholic beverages. Well, in their in their honor, I'm going to go ahead and. Uh... Fix myself oh, a drink here, then. There you go. 
So um, nice, nice. let me ask you. So Jim, when when where were you in the journey uh, when you first when you had your first drink post op? How how long were you? Um, so I was uh, honestly about nine months out. Um, the first thing I tried was beer because I tend to be a beer drinker. Um, it didn't go so well, honestly. I didn't feel too good after. Um, the carbonation, I think, messed with me a little bit. Um, so then I waited till probably further out, maybe 14 months before I actually had something again. Um, you know, that was personal choice I made. Uh, I kind of was more just testing the waters just to see, like, how would I react? Because I keep hearing, you know, oh, it's going to hit you different. It's going to this. It's going to that. You know, it's going to have, you're going to have this type of issue or that type of issue. And I just kind of was, like, basically testing the waters. Um, for me personally, um, like I said, I, quite honestly, like I said, now that I've sort of gone through it and I sort of like look back on the, the mistakes I made, I would, um, when I, when I talk about moderation and, you know, you should be able to have, go, off, go off plan, you know, like I said, I'm talking about from my perspective now after I'm at goal, I've been you know, in maintenance for quite a long time now. Um, when I was first doing, you know, the... The, after right after surgery, um, I was super strict, you know. So I'm kind of the type that stay on plan as much as you can, you know. Try not to go off plan um, for the first until you get goal to goal, basically. However long that's going to take you, um, I uh, I went off plan once um, early out. That was three months after because I had my surgery in September, and it was well the very first holiday was December, you know, was in Christmas time. I went off plan, so talk about stalling, okay? I've never had a stall until three months out. So I went off plan, was eating crap, basically, and uh, so for a day and a half, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, I pretty much ate what I wanted, um, and my weight stopped. And at that time, I was losing a pound a day at least. Um, so my weight stalled out for 21 days. So for three weeks, Holy I was eating the same amount just from <laughs> eating going off plan for, for a day and a half. So I learned my lesson. I honestly did not go off plan after that. And my doctor's plan is pretty strict. It's like he wants you to do 100 plus grams of protein. He wants you to do less than 40 carbs a day. And I was probably doing less than 20 a day most days. And he wants you to do 100 ounces of water daily. He wants you to exercise 45 minutes minimum a day, um, seven days a week or an hour and a half every, you know, five days a week or so. Um, so, yeah, I learned my lesson. And so, you know, sometimes when I see people, like, they're two weeks out and they're already asking about when they can eat pizza and things like that, you know, I'm just a little worried. You know, I worry wait, about that. Wait, wait. You know. <laughs> That's um, a pretty bad sign. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, there's people that, you know, I mean, that's the decision. If you if, if you have that, you know, that mindset, you know, uh, I think they're the people I, I you know, because I've been around on the, on these forums for, you know, back in the day there was no, there wasn't that many Facebook groups as far as I know for weight loss surgery. Um, YouTube, the same thing. The main forum was, uh, there was a few of them, but um, Obesity Help was a big one that I was on. Um, I'm still on there, I just don't go on very often. Um, and there was one called Vertical Sleeve Talk. Um, actually, um, I met uh, Chris Waffle on both of those. We were both pretty uh, active on both of those years ago. I, I knew I knew Chris before he even had his surgery, actually. Um, back when he was still a big, fat fatty. I got pictures of him, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he came to one of our meetups, yeah. A anyway, so, um, you know, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of information. There wasn't a whole lot of forms and things to talk to people with and to learn learn things, you know. But um, So I've been around for a while. I've been, you know, so I've been doing this, I mean, as far as, on these forums and things and, and, you know, chat rooms or whatever you want to call them for going on seven years now. And I think the people I see that struggle the most are the ones who kind of veered off plan early and were kind of like you could just tell that they were like not doing what they were supposed to do. They were the types who kind of had the attitude of I can kind of eat whatever I want and I'm still losing weight. So I had this surgery just to eat normally, but just eat smaller portions. And it's like, okay, well, I mean, I think that some people that have that attitude take it to the extremes. I mean, you know, the problem is you we're not normal. You know, um, there's a reason why we've had the surgery is because we're not normal. We can't eat like a normal person, and you can't probably, you're not going to be able to moderate yourself and just eat 
yes, you're eating small portions, and yes, the restriction is is fucking amazing at the beginning, you know, but two years down the road, you know, two months down the road, you know, six months down the road, you're going to, you know, you're going to have less restriction. You're going to have less food intolerances. You're going to have to, you know, if you don't do that, that mind work, you don't train your brain and sort of retrain it to, to think a different way about food and to, you know, if your attitude is still, I had the surgery and cause, cause trust me for the first three months to six months with any surgery, you can kind of still eat shitty and still lose weight, you know, Right, your body, you're you're gonna lose. You you got so much restriction and you so much food intolerances, and you're really concentrating on just getting the protein and shit. So if someone, you know, if you're, if someone, especially if you're not a person like a, a bypasser who dumps, which a lot of bypassers don't dump, um, you know, you can still eat junk in the first, you know, six months and still lose weight. And I hate to say that because I don't want people just like to start start testing it. And, you know, going, oh well, Jim says I can lose weight if I still eat shit. Let me test that. You know. But eventually, it's going to catch up to you, you know, because eventually you won't have that much restricting, restriction. You won't have as many food intolerances. You'll, you can, you know, you can. I, I tell people all the time: the good thing about the sleeve is I can eat anything I want. The bad thing about the sleeve is I can eat anything I want. <laughs> right. You know, exactly. So, exactly. So you could, you could, you know, honestly, you can grade yourself back up to the same weight you were, you know, and that's the problem. And like I said, in the past, I see a lot of these people who they're like, oh, well, I didn't have the surgery to be on a diet all the time. Okay, well, it's not a diet. It's really a lifestyle change. I mean, if you have the diet mentality, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't, it, it's just not a good attitude to have as, you know, well, well, I hate being on this diet. I hate doing the protein shakes. I hate doing, you know, we all had to do it, you know. I mean, fucking protein shakes suck. Nobody likes the way they taste. It tastes like shit. You know, but you got to do what you got to do. At least you get to, you know, to lose the weight to do, and to sort of train yourself to sort of get to the healthy point you need to be to, to make this a lifelong commitment, you know. I mean, it's not just that I'm going to lose the weight it's gonna, and, and a year later I can start, start eating whatever the fuck I want all the time. You know, it doesn't work that way. Right. No, I understand. Like, hey, a uh, question I had for you just because talking about, like, your entire your, your process and your journey at this point and you mentioned um, like the kind of uh, restrictions that your surgeon had had placed on you immediately post op with 100 plus grams of you know protein and 40 less than 40 grams of carbs and whatnot. I mean, as far as like back then and then kind of now in your maintenance period, what kind of like protein calorie range are you typically working with on a regular basis? You know, I honestly don't track at this point, and I probably should still. I just don't. Um, but I'm kind of the type of person that I really kind of eat the same things over and over again. So I know generally, you know, if I've made, um, for instance, I've got uh, turkey and uh, beef chili mixed in the, um, the fridge right now, I kind of know that the numbers are if I eat six ounces of it, it's got you know, 24, 25 grams of protein. It's got 250 calories. It's got, you know, so I already know what those, those numbers are usually. Um, I don't have a protein goal at this point. I'm not really working out. So I don't really have a protein goal of let me have, I need 100 grams of protein. A day. I think if I'm getting 60 or 70, that's fine. You know, um, I think your, your, your goals are going to change after you've sort of gone through the initial process and the weight loss, you know. At some point, you know, a lot of the protein why we need it is for healing, and it's also to maintain more muscle mass, and it's also to satiate you and keep you fuller longer. You know, well, once you're two years out or whatever, you're sort of maintaining. You're not going to need probably 100 or 150 grams of protein. Sure, sure. Unless you're in the gym two or three hours a day and you're lifting heavy weights and things like that, or you're a marathon runner or whatever. You know, um, so you need to just change. And at this point, I still try to get a lot of liquid in just because it's healthy. You know, I mean, I think it's good to have 100 ounces of water a day. Um, carbs, I maintenance for me, carb wipes is probably up to, on average a day, maybe 80 to 100, 110. Um, and I think I could do that pretty easily without really having any regain or any issues, honestly. So, okay. um, everybody's different. I mean, you know, I'm a bigger oh, person. Sure, absolutely. So I have my, my, you know... Uh, just, you know, metabolism-wise, you know, everybody's going to have a different number, and it's something that eventually when you do get into maintenance, you're going to have to figure out on your own. You're going to, on your own, you're going to have to figure, okay, well, I need this much protein, and I need this many carbs, and I can do this with, you know, 
and still stay with them in the ranges and the weight I want and things like that. So, Andrew, why don't you take, uh, you want to field some of those Facebook questions? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so Tanya, who, uh, as we mentioned, unfortunately, she is uh, not with us watching tonight, but she did uh, send in a, uh, a few questions here. So let me go here. It says, um, as she said, question for Jim. Obviously, you've been a great success, and you uh, definitely find a way to have good, have foods that you love, but also maintain your weight loss. You know, what keeps you from going off the rails? You know, what, what pulls you back on track? You know, what motivates you to stay on track that didn't with other methods of weight loss? Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I I guess I I wasn't truly, I don't, I don't really um, identify myself as a food addict. Um, I don't think I was before surgery. I don't think I am now. I'm definitely a foodie. I love food. Um, I love the same foods I did before surgery. I hate the same foods now as I did before surgery, you know, so I'm a foodie person. I love food. I, I still watch the Food Network and cooking shows. On a, I cook all the, I'm the one that cooks in the, in the house, you know, my wife doesn't cook at all. Um, so I think people that have that sort of food addiction and that type of addictive personality are always going to struggle. They're going to struggle more than somebody like myself who my weight issues, um, my struggles with food and things like that were a lot brought on by um, a lot had to do with you know my health. Um, you know it's directly related to uh, being diabetic, um, insulin resistance, uh, injecting 250 units of insulin every day, having your blood sugar spike up and down. Um, as soon as I got all that under control, and um, by the way, I don't, I don't take any meds or anything now. Um, I haven't since about six months after my surgery. So all of that stuff I've done, That's um, I was on. To oral diabetic meds, I was on high blood pressure medication. I had sleep apnea. I had, I was walking with a cane at one time because I could barely walk. Um, I don't need any of those anymore. Obviously, um, I haven't had any insulin for. Like I said, it took me about six months actually to wean off the insulin, but my blood sugars are basically kind of like a normal person's would be at this point. Um, but yeah, so I, I, you know, I don't. I think I don't struggle necessarily with the food addiction part. Uh, the carb addiction, whatever you want to call it. So for me, it honestly has not been a struggle. Um, my wife, on the other hand, is a little bit different. She um, does struggle with some of those cravings, and you know, I think it's a difference between men and men and women. Also, a uh, man, you know, we don't have cravings because we don't have the issues that a woman does with the hormones, and you know, um, during the monthly cycle and things like that. Um, my wife is, gets hungry during that time. She has certain cravings at that time, you know. I don't have that, the you know, the same hormonal issues and things that go on during that time of the month, so I don't have those cravings, so it, it really doesn't bother me. I think men and women just, in that just sense of it, have different, um, different issues when it comes to dealing with those cravings or, you know, eating carbs and having all these other issues, you know, but... Um, like I said, I think I think the big thing is I just don't think honestly I don't I don't identify myself as a food addict. I don't think I ever was. And once I got once I took part of took care of the physiological reasons for my hunger. Um, obviously, the surgery has helped because it has got rid of most of the ghrelin that's produced, and um, you know I just don't get hungry. I'm one of those types that really still doesn't get hungry five and a half years out. That's good to hear. Yeah, we were we were talking a lot about that last week because we we're still, you know, we're like we sometimes think that we're hungry. We're still trying to figure that out because there are times where I think I'm hungry. I can't tell. I don't know. I'm still like we're still trying to learn that as well because we don't have that same feeling like we all used to when we were, you know, fatties. So it is right. it is a different um, different process. Yeah, that, you know, hunger for me at this point, it's not really, I don't really call it hunger. Um, I know when my stomach's empty when I haven't, um, today for instance, so I've had, I had some chili today. Um, I had some hummus with some peppers, um, you know, those little sweet peppers, mm -hmm. and I had coffee this morning. But am I hungry right now? Absolutely not. I'm just not that hungry. Um, so... 
it's easier for me, okay, but I can honestly say, been it being that in this community for so long, I would say I'm more the exception than the rule. I think most people within six months to a year, maybe two years tops, will eventually get back some level of hunger. Um, obviously, it's a much more, um, it's a different hunger than before. Um, most people sort of describe it as, it's, I'm hungry, I know I'm hungry, um, it's a slight hunger pang, but it's not this overwhelming desire and need to eat. It's not this, if I don't get some food right now, somebody's going to fucking die type of hunger, you know? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's like, I feel hungry, I need to eat. You know, and, and I often tell people, I'm, I'm like, uh, hunger's a good thing. I mean, hunger tells you when your body, you know, when you needs fuel, you know, you need to eat. Um, on my, in my case, sometimes I forget to eat, so then I start feeling like I start feeling weird, or, you know, like I, I get a headache or something, and then my wife will ask me, when was the last time you ate? And I'm like, oh, well, I didn't eat breakfast this morning, and I didn't eat lunch yet, you know, and things like that. So it's a normal response for your body to have is hunger. So to me, when people say, oh, I'm hungry, and I can't, I was told I, I wasn't, wasn't going to be hungry. Well, my doctor never told me that. He never promised me that I wouldn't be hungry, and I, I know a lot of doctors do, and you go to you go to these weight loss, um, what do you call them, like forms and meetings and things, or the, the seminars for your doctor or the surgeon or the hospital, and a lot of them say, oh, if we take out the ghrelin in your body and so you won't be hungry, and, and I, I just don't buy it. You know, I think that, uh, first of all, ghrelin's made in other places in your body, like your pancreas, so um, I think your body kind of adjusts, and, it, and when you're hungry, your body's going to find some way to tell you you're hungry and you need to eat. Um, so to me, it's not... It's not a horrible thing to be hungry, you know. I think a lot of people are afraid of it, you know. I'll, I'm not hungry now, and that's an awesome feeling, but, you know, in a few months I'm going to start getting hungry, and I fear that, and a lot of people fear the fact that they may get hungry at some point. Um, to me, I don't, because the difference is before when I got hungry, and my hungry was like raging like hunger, I mean, because my diabetes and my blood sugar were up and down, up and down all the time. Um, so your body basically tells you, you need to eat something, you need to eat it now. Um, the difference is I could go pound down two Big Macs and a fry and a large fries and, you know, a 10-piece nuggets in, you know, 15 minutes, you know, when I was hungry. And then have dinner after that. Exactly. Two, an hour later. No, seriously. Right. Hey, yeah. Jim, speaking of that, why don't you hold up that picture you got I'd like, and, and, and oh, keep, keep telling us about what you used to eat. <laughs> <laughs> um. But you know, I, I was time, I was kind of like I was I had a big appetite, but I was also a grazer. I would eat all day long just because my my uh, my hunger um, you know fluctuated so much. So here's my picture. Can you see it? Yeah, here it is. That's me um, at probably five fifty. Um, that's actually, amazing. Amazing. Check it out. I, I still got that shirt. Oh here's shit, it. that's awesome. I'm gonna I'm gonna have all back up to show you guys. Hold on. Oh, we got a body shot. Uh -huh. Oh, there we go. Can you see it? Wow, holy shit. That's amazing, bro. I, I can't shirt. because it's covering up the entire camera. I can't see anything else but the shirt. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it that good or not. I said yeah, I said I said I couldn't see anything else but the shirt. It was covering up the whole camera. It was all, that was crazy. Check it out. Check it out. It's a fucking king size. And it's a seven X. Wow. See? Damn, what are you down um, to now? Like, well, what kind of shirt typically? I can wear an extra large now. Um, nice. At my very smallest, I was wearing between. I would wear if I wore a large, it was tight, but I could fit into a large. Um, I wear an extra large comfortably now. Um, but uh, you know, and my waist size was a 68 um, at my biggest, um, wow. and now it's a 38. I can wear a 38 pant. Um, I got down to a 36. If I didn't have this extra. 20 pounds, I'd probably still be wearing a 36. Tight 36, and I would wear my shit tight, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Dude, you, that's amazing, bro. That's such, such an inspiration, man, really. That's really okay. amazing. I got, we got a bunch of questions on, uh, on the right, YouTube cool. side. If you don't mind, uh, Andrew, cool. I'm going to sure. take one of those. Go for uh, it, let's see. We got, uh, we got VSG Lynette. She has a question. For those of us in the long haul, how do you keep yourself motivated to get up and do it daily. My honeymoon phase is definitely over. So, what motivates you? How do you keep yourself uh, motivated? You know, it, it's. I think. Um, first of all, I, I honestly try to stay connected to the community. 
um, not so much on the YouTubes and um, other places, but I am pretty active on Facebook. Um, I don't do obesity help anymore, obviously. Um, but I'm also involved locally. Uh, I'm pretty involved with our local community. Um, I, uh, I run support groups here locally at one of the hospitals. And um, you know, most of our friends are weight loss surgery people at this point. My wife and I have connected with several people locally. Um, and we've become extremely close to them. So we're connected to the weight loss surgery community and the lifestyle. And, you know, I have, I'm lucky enough. Um, I don't, did I mention this? My wife's also a sleever. She had her sleeve uh, three and a half years ago. That answers a couple of questions that yeah, people were asking as well. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, Jennifer, so. Yeah, Jennifer Bleacher was uh, wondering. Um, she wanted to know if uh, you think uh, Mr. Bates – killed Mr. Green. Oh, wait a minute. That's Downton Abbey for him. It's a different forum. She wanted to know, <laughs> did you meet your wife pre or post-op? And she also said so, she's gorgeous. She said she's gorgeous. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes, she is. She's amazing. Um, we um, we met uh, at actually like a, a weight loss surgery meet and greet. It was an obesity help, oh, through obesity help, but not an official sanction event. It was a bunch of friends from Obesity Help kind of put this meet and greet thing together, and I flew out here to Atlanta to actually meet and hang out. Um, I talked with my wife for a grand total of maybe five minutes that whole night, um, but then later on, um, we had reconnected on Facebook and started talking. Um, she was actually uh, seeing somebody at the time. I was single at the time, um, but uh, so uh, reconnected on Facebook, started talking. I eventually flew out here, um, spent some time with her. We did the long distance thing for a short time, um, and I eventually moved out here. Um, I've been out here for about a year and a half now. And then we just recently got married in um, September of, uh, of last year. So Yeah, congrats. I saw those pictures, man. Those were, Thank you. Those were awesome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, really cool. Hey, wasn't there a, a, another? Was there another Facebook question? There was. There was kind. Of, I'm gonna kind of combine it. Tanya had one other question, but it kind of combines a little bit with uh, Liz. I'm gonna probably butcher her last name. Uh, Le, Le, either Leggerini or Le, Legarini. Um, kind of combining it to. You did mention it a little bit, but um, Tanya kind of said, "What do you do? You feel a sense of responsibility to kind of share your journey with newbies? Um, what kind of keeps you active in the community?" And then, kind of with that newbie, you know, mentality, um, what is like, what is the most valued piece of advice that you could give somebody who is pre-op? Oh shit! Um, <laughs> don't listen to me because I'm drink, I'm drinking a fucking. Oh. So so here's the deal: I'm drinking um, with a straw, carbonation, and um, alcohol. Uh, a lot of things that weight loss surgery people aren't supposed to do. Um, so maybe you shouldn't listen to me. Um, no, seriously though, um, so what keeps me sort of motivated and connected to the community and sort of the sense of responsibility thing? You know, I don't, I, I do enjoy sort of sharing my story. And when I first started out, um, I was the only sleever like in a lot of the groups that I went to locally and things, you know, so I, I imagine. yeah, uh, there was, there was, it was all bypass people and band people. So I kind of felt like, okay, well I'm alone here, but it was almost like, okay, well, you know, I want to sort of come here to these groups and sort of discuss my experience and, and you know, sort of represent for the sleevers, you know. And so I've continued. I mean, it's it's strange because over the years, seeing how groups have changed, and not just groups, but even the bariatric community, you know, the, these bigger forms, you know, there's big, huge, there's huge um, on Facebook, there's big, huge uh, sleeve-only groups, you know. I mean, they have other people in there, but basically it's, you know sleeve specific um, groups, um, it's it's quickly becoming a very popular surgery and we see that like locally um, in our groups it's like it used to be all bypass people when we first went there, we were like the only two or three sleevers and now it's the opposite, there's more than half of the people, the new people getting surgery, there's probably 60% of them are all sleevers now. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool, um, but uh, I honestly think that me still being involved in the community honestly is um, it's a lot of it is still accountability for myself I think I use it kind of to stay connected and to sort of still have that connection so I don't lose focus I don't like sort of you know like Walter said I mean you know I'm a lifelong fatty so you know if I sort of 
start thinking now, okay, well now I've lost the weight, but I'm a normal person now. I can just kind of do what I want, kind of go about my life and do things and go back to my lifestyle the way I was. You know, well, I had to sort of remember where I came from, you know, and that I'm not a normal person. I will always have the fat person mentality. Um, I may have the same, you know, the the fears and the, the insecurities and thing that somebody some of somebody that was five or six hundred pounds, you know. Um, I, I think it's you know, people say that, you know, how long does it take you to get used to being smaller and things like that? Um, I don't know if I'll ever get used to it one hundred percent. You know, I, I and I know there's been a lot of discussion, you know, of like with T J and Phil and and Walter, you know, and people talking about and Tanya talking about the differences between someone who was a lifelong fatty as opposed to somebody who got fatter as an adult or when they're older. Right. And I, I do think there's a big difference, you know. It's just, you know, that being fat for that long and having those experiences growing up has really shaped who we are today, you know, in a lot of ways, for better or for worse. Um, my wife was not fat until she was in college. And so her experience was a little bit different. You know, she has a different attitude than I do sometimes. She she doesn't know what it's like to grow up and, you know, be teased and be the fattest kid in the class and things like that, you know, where I do, you know. Um, so sometimes, yeah, things, there are differences in, in, in that aspect. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't, you know, uh, I, um, as far as, like, you know, staying connected, I think that's why it's important for me to stay connected because I honestly use it as, it's a selfish reason, honestly. I use it as a way to sort of keep account accountability. That's why I go to uh, local groups. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing selfish about you know trying to keep your own keep your own self accountable. I mean, that makes perfect sense. I mean, but I you know I do I do enjoy you know I do enjoy talking with um, people, sharing my experiences, asking them, you know answering questions. And I do really enjoy that also. You know, um, and as far as like what was the other question? Um, about uh, oh, the piece of advice for newbies. Um, I would say number one, um, you trust the process. Um, this does work if you work it. Um, there's a lot of people early out there like, oh, I'm not losing enough weight, or I didn't lose weight, or I stalled out, or whatever. You know, do not give up early <laughs> in the stages. Actually, because, yeah. um, it does work. Sorry, Jim. Just but why are you talking about stalls? Sister Scaleback has that question. Like, what do you do? What advice do you have? to someone uh, to break a stall in the weight loss phase? Oh, so in the weight loss phase, you know, you're going to hit stalls. Um, weight loss is not a downward slope. It's not an even downward slope. It's a stair-step slope. So you'll lose, you'll stall, you'll lose, you'll stall, you'll lose, you'll stall, and, and sort of a stair-step pattern. It's not a, just a slope straight down. Um, so expect stalls. You know, the, the, There's the famous what's called a three-week stall. You'll have that about three weeks out. Um, most people, two to three weeks, will have their first stall, and that's because the majority of the weight you're going to lose at first is going to be mostly water weight, and it's a you know a glycogen replacement is what happens, and your body needs water to replace that, and then it'll lose the fat. Um, but you really, that's why you know people will say, well, why do you need to drink so much water? It's because when you're losing weight for about, I believe it's every pound of fat you lose, you need you lose like five to eight pounds of water. So to replace that, you have to drink a lot of water to lose weight. And it sounds weird because people are like, well, if I drink a lot of water, I'll, I'll, I'll retain water. You do temporarily. You know, so to break a stall, honestly, there's really no trick. Stick to what you're doing. Stick to the high protein, low carb. Increase your water and increase your exercise, your activity. And that's about it. And get enough rest. You know, people don't put enough em emphasis on rest and sleep, um, you know, uh, missing sleep and stress and things like that actually cause your body to hold on to weight and to actually put fat on. And, you know, there's a cortisol, which is a stress hormone. There's, um, did you know that, I mean, you may not know this, if you don't get enough sleep, they actually show that um, your ghrelin levels rise the next day. So if you're not getting enough sleep, then you'll probably be hungry the next day, and that's one of the reasons. Yep, so definitely all great of these point. Things, so, yeah, very, um, very good point, Jim. So just, you know, be patient, I would say. That's another thing. Just really have patience. You know, like I said, the process works if you work it. You know, just, you know, not everybody's going to lose weight at the same time. Don't compare yourself to other people. You know, if somebody's lost 100 pounds in a year and you're still not there yet, no, just just wait. Just you know, be patient. Do not give up. 
just keep doing what you're doing. If you, I think if you stick to the same things, you just realize everybody's going to stall. You're going to stall at some point. And just keep doing the same things with the water, the protein. Stick to your, your plan, whatever your dietary, the doctor told you to do. Just keep doing it and trust the process because it does work, you know. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and that's something I think we had talked about. I think I did a video myself not too long ago just saying, you know, my journey is not your journey. My journey is not Walter's. It's my journey. How I'm going to lose is however my body's going to lose. But exactly. you can't you can't lose the weight if you know you're off track with it. So I, I like how you said it will not work unless you work it. Which I mean, I, I think that's the one thing I'm going to take away from this is that you know that that that's you know couldn't have you know that that's the one that's the good that's the one piece of advice I think to take away is that you need to trust the process and work it, mm -hmm. you know, or else you're, uh, you know, you're going to, you know, be stalling out this whole time. As I sit here drinking alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> or as I've, you know, I've even, you know, I've, I've even, I'm, um, you know, bad to say, not even four months out, I've, I've had a few beers already myself and um, my body, you're fine with it, ah, but I'm still like, it's a beer at a time. And maybe right. once or twice a week, if that. So right. I'm still, I, I'm, I'm taking my time with it, regardless. Yeah. And there, and there are going to be people just because of their, their own personal metabolic um, levels and their own physiological makeup that can do a little bit more carb. That can eat. You know, you don't look at somebody that's eating junk and think you can do that because you might not be able to. You know, right? And everybody's different, like I say. You know. I was going to ask you, Jim, too, with especially, you know. Being where Walter and I are, and where you have been in your journey through this whole journey, how has it been? Because just out of my own curiosity too, with your body and you know skin and you know losing that um, excessive amount, how has that been right. during the journey? So um, Walter and I talked a little bit about this the other day. Um, you know, being that I was so big and I have lost a ton of weight, um, I'm actually quite surprised mine's not as bad as one would think. Um, I attribute most of that to genetics. Um, I'm half Asian. My mom's a little tiny 110-pound Asian woman. <laughs> um, and so she has really good skin. I, I, I think that's what probably the majority of it, of it is, is the skin issues after are going to be. And I have some, don't get me wrong, I still have some problem areas, my thighs and my lower stomach in particular. Um, but like my arms, for instance, if you look at my arms, they're not like, you know, they're not like there's a little bit right here. But not much, you know. Okay. And you know, so it's different for everybody, right? Um, I think it depends. The main thing that it, it is genetics is probably number one. Uh, age is probably number two. Um, and then uh, after that would probably be how damaged your skin is. I mean, were you super morbidly obese for twenty years or only for five years? You know, that makes a difference too because it's stretched out. It's going to stay stretched out. Um. But honestly, for me, I haven't had that much of an issue. But I do wear, I should have brought something here to show you. Um, like they're made by Jockey, like the underwear that's a little bit longer. It's kind of okay. like a spandex type thing. Um, they can be kind of hot in the summertime, the only thing is. so. But I, mean, I do wear that to just to sort of keep things sort of like tucked in so that I don't get any like rubbing. But kind mine's like, kind of, like a like bicycle short kind of thing? Yeah, exactly. Right. They're a little bit longer. They're a little bit like a, more uh, like a spandex type thing. Okay. Um, they, uh, I will say that like my skin's honestly not bad enough that I would actually qualify like through insurance. You know, like you can you can get it approved if it's really bad and you have rubbing and you have rashes and you have infections and you have open sores and things. I never get any of that. I don't. My skin's not that bad that I get that type of stuff. So I honestly wouldn't qualify even for the surgery. You know, I mean, I I know if you've seen any of those shows like My Six Hundred Pound Life and stuff, some of those people have really really a lot of extra excess skin. Um, mine's not nearly as bad as that, so I, I was lucky, I guess. Well, good, yeah. definitely not a bad thing. I was just yeah. curious about that because I, I mean, I'm trying to do what I can now because I'm doing a lot of, I'm exercising as much as I can and getting like weightlifting and a decent amount of cardio, and I'm trying to do that for one, just for general health, right? Of course, but at the same time, I want to, you know get my muscles, you know, built up. I want to, you know, get my body moving. You know, I want to help keep that, keep everything as tight as I can get it now 
while I'm still in the losing phase. Right. And, and, and you know, honestly, you know, uh, for most people, you know, there's there's a bunch of people out there that will say, use this for your skin. If you use this cream, and if you do this and that, there really isn't no magic fix. There right. is uh, the creams are all bullshit. Those wrap things, you know, those it works wraps or whatever that you see advertised. It's a temporary thing, you know. Um, so I ignore that skin, shit every time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, like I said, um, men probably have a little bit, um, a bit higher chance of like at least filling out their their excess skin with some muscle, like in your chest and in your your shoulders and your arms. You know, for like maybe bat wing type of situation. But honestly, it's not gonna. You know, the exercise and stuff doesn't necessarily tighten up the skin. That's just that's a that's a myth also. Um, what's going to happen is you can build muscle underneath it and sort of fill it out again. Um, but most women are not going to get huge bodybuilder status and work out six hours a day to build enough muscle to fill up really big bat wings. You know, that just doesn't happen. So so speaking about uh, working out, uh, Pete Sleeve Rocker, we love Pete. He's the, he's a, he's the, he's a freaking workout. Yeah, I know Pete, yeah. Well, he was, he was wondering, uh, what was your fitness strategy? What has been your fitness strategy, both losing and maintain and maintaining? So my fitness you- strategy um, early out was okay. So I was still big, like I said, I was still almost 600 pounds when I had surgery. So at first, it was honestly just walking. I was still using a cane to walk. Um, when I first actually still hit, when I first hit the gym, it was um, I was still walking with a cane. Um, so I hit the gym at probably 430 pounds, 440 pounds still, um, and it was just about uh, 20 minutes to half an hour of cardio, and the rest was just all weight training. Um, I'm a big believer in you build, uh, you want to maintain as much muscle mass as possible during the losing phase especially. Um, So I was working out four days a week, the gym, um, and then at home again, I was doing a lot of cardio and just walking. I kept work and on my lunch hour and things like that. So um, Cardio was uh, the elliptical, uh, the treadmill, the uh, uh, life cycle, um, and then lifting weights the other 45 minutes to an hour at the gym. Um, I just feel that building muscle, uh, you want to maintain as much muscle as possible, number one. Number two, um, increasing muscle mass also burns, metabolically burns way more uh, calories than fat does, for one thing, um, and increases metabolism, obviously, and helps with the weight loss. So I think it's important for men and women, actually, to both use resistance training and weight training to sort of maintain, number one, but also to build muscle mass. I think that's a good thing. So um, were now you, at this uh, point... Sorry, Jim. Were you, uh, were you, were you uh, resistance training like, pretty much as soon as you were cleared? Yeah, just a little bit. Not a ton. Um, I just honestly, I, I have dumbbells at the house, just the adjustable dumbbells that I, I, I used to use all the time. Um, uh, recently, like I said, because of my being sort of laid up. Um, I can't even, it's difficult for me to do almost anything. Um, I do, the doctors actually gave me a wheelchair to use, so I do push myself around in that a lot as sort of exercise. Um, but as far as like the lifting, because it's still difficult for me to, just to lift weights because anybody knows that if you lift weights anything over like 20 pounds, it's, you, have, you need balance and you need to put your feet down on the ground to do it. And it's just difficult for me to do because I'm not supposed to be putting my foot on the ground at all, honestly. So, um, recently, it hasn't been a whole lot. So the past 18 months to two years, I honestly have not pretty much been sitting on my ass is what I've been doing, you know. Now, from my perspective, that's one of the things, and yet another thing that I feel I have in common with you is this this, this sense of disability and, and trying to get through things. Like, And I know for myself, that's a whole other mental anguish that goes on because you, you, you feel you, you're sort of disappointed that you, you can't do what other people are doing. Right. In your case, you know, you, you you know, you're just physically unable to do those things. So how did how, how do you you know uh, combat that mentally? You know, you just, I mean, basically, my way is to just stay stay you know really vigilant with the food, and right. you know, do as much as I can. But I know that it can really can, can really get to you mentally. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I I would never say to somebody don't exercise or don't try to do what you can. Um, exercise has so many benefits, you know, obviously you can't argue the benefits of exercise, but as purely a weight loss strategy on its own, you can't just exercise away food. I mean, it's just a fact, you know, you know what they say is you can't outrun calories, you know, because you can eat, you can work out for an hour and burn five, 600 calories, 
you could eat that calories, those calories back within five minutes. So it really has to be a, a dual, you know, just the old school, what they've always said, diet and exercise has to be for the optimum weight loss and results and maintenance has to be, it has to be, you have to do both, you know. Um, Son of unfortunately, a bitch. Son of a bitch. It's that easy. Yeah, really. No shit. The fucking diet and exercise. Thank you, <laughs> fucking, you know, fucking Einstein. Why didn't you tell me that before, you know? But, uh, yeah, it's uh, that's what it goes back to, you know. But basically, you know, you can lose the weight. I, I have friends that have lost 100% of the excess weight without lifting a fucking finger. They haven't done shit, but they lost all the weight. Unfortunately, oh. some of those friends... Uh, also have zero muscle mass left. They're extremely weak. They're out of shape. You, you know, they can't fucking carry groceries from the car to the house. You know, things like that. So do I recommend it? Absolutely not. Can you do it? Yes. Um, should you do it? Probably not. Um, and in your case, Walter, because you are limited with your mobility and stuff, like you said, I know you do some things like, you know, that you can do, and I think that's it. You just try to do what you can do. I mean, what that means going, you know, to a pool or water aerobics or those type of things, you know, that's what you got to do. You know, like I said, um, I was pretty limited too. You know, like I said, I was walking with a cane. I went to the gym and kind of found things that were easy on my joints that I could do. You know, the elliptical or you know, rowing or you know, a bicycle. There's other things that you can do that are, you know, probably a little bit better to do. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think the key is just, you know, keep pushing yourself, keep challenging yourself, and, and, and mix it up, do different things, you know, and, and, and stay active as much as you can, I, I think, you know, as far as, you know, as that goes. But I'm a little then, hungry, so okay if I have a snack? Yeah, go ahead. You go for it, man. So um, do you have uh, there, are there any more Facebook questions? I think that was it on the Facebook questions. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, that was it pretty much for Facebook. I'm eating like, chocolate donuts because they have protein in them. These things have <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. This is part of the uh, do as I say, not as I do portion of the don't, show. Yeah, don't listen to me. Everything I've said before, just this fucking donut negates all that shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of like with um, oh, we got we got to bring him up, uh, Gooch. I remember watching oh, sometimes yeah. he was he would do uh, videos where he'd be uh, eating bags of Doritos, and I'm like, dude, what the hell? <laughs> I'm just fucking with you guys, but oh, I know. It, it, it it does. It does go back to my point of, you know, moderation works for me. Um, but by moderation, I mean probably 90% of my eating is on plan and 10% is off plan. So what does that mean for me? Well, I try to eat five to six meals a day. So multiply that by seven days a week. You know, I'm eating 35 to, you know, 35 meals a, a week, let's say. So three meals or s snacks, as I call them, can be off plan. It's 10%. That's what I do now. Would I have done that the first year? Absolutely not. I was 99% right. on plan the first until I lost the weight. Um, but there's a lot of things that go on in the community. There's a lot of food police out there and people that are saying, you absolutely can't do this. You absolutely, you know, like I said, I've got, this is all the sleeve sins in one pretty much. I got alcohol, which you're not supposed to have. I'm using a straw, which you're not supposed to have. It's carbonation, which you're not supposed to have because you'll stretch your sleep. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to fucking risk my health for you people out there. This is an experiment. I'm using a straw. I'm drinking alcohol and carbonation. So wait around, stick around and see if my sleeve actually explodes. Uh, he's uh, doing it for us, not him. Exactly. Someone's got to fucking do the shit. I mean, you know. And oh, I'm eating and drinking at the same time. Look. Oh, 30-30 rule. Come on, man. This is like a WLS jackass. Yeah, don't fucking listen to me, exactly. <laughs> I'm Johnny Knoxville. <laughs> but, um, well, a lot, of, a lot of these myths out there about carbonation and, you know, your straws and shit like that, are, they're just bullshit. Right. Oh, that's, I mean, oh. uh, man, I'm surprised TJ's not watching because he'd probably be humping your leg. He'd be so happy right now. Well, he's, oh, really? he's, doing the, he's at New Orleans. He's at oh, New Orleans. that's right. That's right. He's oh. with that crew. Otherwise, he would Maybe be they'll be watching this while they're getting drunk. Maybe. Could be. And drinking carbonation, trying to blow up their sleeves <laughs> or their pouches. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Well, yeah, no, I think it's great. I mean, you know, obviously there's just so many. I think, you know, we were talking about this uh, or 
I mean, I feel the same way that a lot of the the research was originally done for this for the for the bypass and the pouch, right. and it just sort of got lumped onto the sleeve, and 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 it's way different. Well, the thing is, a lot of doctors out there still have all their information is bypass based, so it's specific to the bypass. So they're going to give the informational packet to their patients. It's going to have the rules for the bypass, basically, and that's what happens a lot. Is you know. It's bullshit rules for the bypass, you know, and we're very different, you know, in a lot of ways. Uh, Liz is calling you out for not chewing like about 25 chews per mouthful. <laughs> Watch <laughs> this. Are we on strike 10 now at this point? Please go <laughs> shine. We, we haven't, we, you know, our first guest is going to die on camera. That's going to be terrible. <laughs> By the way, I'm drinking a, what I call it, angry balls. Oh, <laughs> I, saw, I saw fireball right there. Fireball, Angry Orchard. Oh my God! It's called Angry Balls. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um. Wow. Yeah. Now with uh, with alcohol, do you find it like what a lot of people say is you uh, you it hits you pretty pretty quick and uh, absolutely it, it gets it out of you fast. Anyway. Okay. I'm getting fucking wasted off this shit. I didn't even finish it yet. <laughs> In my fucking redneck. Fucking mug. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, it does for me. Um, I don't know if this is an advantage or a disadvantage, but um, it also um, I still work really quick too. Within half an hour, probably, I'm fine. What's that? I still work really quick. Like within oh, yeah. half an hour of drinking, I I feel it really quick. It hits really quick, but you know I'm 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 probably okay to drive within half an hour. Now that's what that's what Tanya has said is that you know you you find that you know if you if you do drink and you do end up getting uh, getting blitzed uh, you will you will never oh uh, never should say hardly ever have a hangover. Yeah, I mean you know because I think it's on such such a smaller amount of alcohol for one thing. Right. Um, but like I said, I do I do say to people you know if you're going to drink um, you should probably test it out at home first to see how you react and see really how you react to it and what's going to happen when you do drink. Um, right. You know, there's been some studies out there that, you know, people with a bypass, for instance, can actually get drunk and test over the limit with just one or two drinks because it gets into their intestines so quick. So it is a concern. With us, with a well, sleeve. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, with a sleeve, um, we, have sort of a, a norm, we have a normally functioning pyloric valve and stomach, so it's not... I don't think as much of a concern, but we do definitely have. It does hit us different, you know. Um, We're just not as cheap of a date. Yeah, we still are. I mean, shit, two drinks, and I'm pretty. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. Um, but yeah, um, you know, cause like I said, I have bypass friends who literally, like, on two sips, they're like already fucked up, and I'm like, really? But a you know, different surgery hits them a little bit different, you know. They, you know, they don't. They have, don't. They don't have a pyloric valve to sort of stop the liquid and sort of release it into their intestines. It goes straight in. You know? So, yeah, be careful. I mean, if you are, if you are going to drink, really be careful. I mean... Well, like you said, it's all about, I mean, regardless whether it's, you know, carbs or, you know, alcohol right. or whatever, it's all about moderation. And know. it's personal choice. I mean, some people choose That's not true. to. I mean, you go for it. You know, I don't, I don't put people down because they don't want to. I mean, some people don't want to drink or they don't want to eat carbs because they know themselves and that's good. I mean if you know yourself well enough that it's gonna be an issue for you, then hey, don't do it, you know, that's a good thing. You know. For me it's not an issue. I mean I can eat donuts on occasion and fucking drink fucking angry balls and be fine. Uh oh. Well better to drink them than eat them. Exactly. <laughs> So I, I think uh, I mean I think we're pretty much done on questions. I mean it was it was uh, everybody's been really good. Oh Phil, wait Phil is saying that TJ is not in Nola, so there's no excuse for you not to be here, TJ. I'm sorry. Where the hell is he? Yeah, yeah. I mean normally he at least put in a, a you know a, a you know comment of some sort you know already talking about you know probably oh God God knows what I can't even think straight right now. Yeah, I mean he, uh, he's not drinking his white Russian. Is that what he drinks all the time? Yeah, that's his drink. That's his big Lebowski. No, last time mm -hmm. he was having uh, what was he having? He was having an old fashioned the last time I saw. Yes, him. that's right. He's he's fucking uh, Don Draper. 
<laughs> so, what was I going to say, though? Um, did anybody else? Did I have another question? No, not really. Um, is the live chat thing going, or is that? Not yeah, 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 it's, it's, it's we, I've, been, I've, been you, uh, I've been hitting you up with the questions as they've been coming in. All right, cool. Yeah, Sister Scaleback says he's doing it in the name of science, which is oh, absolutely yeah. for science, man, for science. Exactly. Science. I'm the guinea pig. I'll be the guinea pig. <laughs> sure. So, um, do you actually, I'm sorry, uh, what's your name again? Andrew. Sorry, Andrew, to cut you off, but I was just going to ask, Jim, so you don't do videos, but you, you are on Facebook. No, yeah, I'm on Facebook, um, James Haney uh, on Facebook. Okay. Um, I am also still on Obesity Help as Jimbo VSG. I've been on there since 2009, 2010, something like that. And so I'm still on uh, um, I'm still on Obesity Help. I just don't go on there very often anymore. Um, but yeah, James Haney on Facebook. If you want to hit me up there, um, and like I said, on Obesity Help, I'm Jimbo VSG. But I don't I don't go in on that account very often. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. I just and I'm in all the big groups too. Um, there's a lot of there's a bariatric surgery support group. That's a big huge group on Facebook. There's Sassy Sleevers, which is a big huge group on Facebook. There's Gastric Sleeve Support Group, which is a big huge support group. I'm in I'm in all of those groups usually. So yeah, I like I recently started going to the Super Size one, which uh, yeah yeah I, I think I'm on that one too. Yeah yeah, which is yeah. you know it's it's super a great super place you know for for yeah. for us larger people. I only went there because I thought it was a fucking super-sized French fry shit, and I went on there. There was a bunch of big patties, and I'm like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> Come on. Where's my fries, dude? <laughs> yeah. Oh, hold on. We, uh, we got to mention this, too, uh, before we forget. We are popping Jim's hang Google Hangout cherry. Yes, and my YouTube cherry. Yes. Okay, baby. He doesn't make videos. We're, 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 you know, we're, we're, bra we're breaking him in because I can almost bet you that Jennifer's gonna get want to get you on the show. The forum's gonna want to get you on the show. Yeah. Everybody's gonna want to get you, but we got you first. Right, we have the exclusive. Yeah. That's a Fat King's exclusive. We'll always have the Google Hangouts together. That's right. <laughs> we'll always have Paris. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a lot of people at least ask me, "How come you don't make videos?" And you know, I think it came up on one of your shows one time. Somebody said, "You know, why don't you make videos?" And it's like, I don't know. I guess I'm like, like I said, it's like I'm. I'm five years old. I'm only supposed to do it. Like I said, go, you know, uh, here's my week 277 update, you know. It's like it's just, you know, I'm eating fucking chocolate donuts and drinking fucking angry balls today. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's a little bit different, I think, than the average newbie probably doesn't want to hear this shit. <laughs> Your first video should be a week 300 update, basically. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Maybe I will. <laughs> I should. I should have a grocery haul. You know those people that do those grocery hauls? Right. They bring in, like, fucking beer, and let's see, we got some fucking chips, we got fucking donuts, and, you know, some fucking whiskey and the vodka, and that's all I got, you know? It's like, okay, grocery haul, week 300, post-VSG. And, and Twinkies. Yeah, but it may, it may, in all honesty, I mean, it makes sense. At your stage, because you're you're well into the maintain ma maintenance, so I mean, for you to do even a monthly update would be yeah, it just yeah, I, ha I had the same stuff. Um, I'm still about the same weight. Um, yeah. see you guys next week. <laughs> yeah, I had fucking you know I can tell them about the the newest food I've tried. I you know I'm always trying the newest shit. So so you know people are doing protein shake reviews and protein bar reviews. I'd be doing like the latest fucking fast food food. You know, it's like oh. I tried the fucking the 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 fried bologna and fucking Velveeta biscuit at Hardee's last week. It was amazing, you know. And it goes well with a shot of Fireball. <laughs> yeah, uh, true story, by the way. It was pretty good. Um, so you know, it's like it's a little bit different for me, you know. But you know, I you know, yeah, I just I just never got into it. And like I said, back in the day, it wasn't that there. I don't know that. There was some people I'm sure on YouTube. I just I never watched any. I, one of the first persons I started watching was Tanya, probably two or three years ago. You know, um, but I didn't. I just uh, like I said, I, I stayed. I, I mostly hung out on obesity help a lot, and I okay. kind of stopped doing that. So, even you know, obesity help basically near the end basically turned out to be kind of like a dating site for me at, at one point. So I had to get off there. My wife probably wouldn't like that too much if I was still on there. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet she wouldn't. Probably not. 
Phil, um, Phil's dropping those. Uh, Phil's dropping those little hints about a uh, veteran show. I know he's. Uh, oh yeah, uh, that would be to... something more down my my cup of coffee, so to speak. You want to do some sort of coffee talk thing? I, I enjoy coffee. Pretty much, it's one of my other things that I'm addicted to. I am addicted to coffee. If I'm addicted to anything, yeah, I gotta have my coffee. So yeah, I'd, I'd be down for that. We could do something. All right, all right. Cool. You heard it, Phil, Jim. Let's you know, come on, Phil. Get that started. Let's make it happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I you know, and I think uh, I think that would be a, a really useful thing for people in maintenance and people who are further out. So I think it's I think that's cool. As long as I'm allowed to drink coffee and eat donuts with it. I'm cool with it. I don't think they're. I don't think any of the veterans are really going to give you any shit for it because they'll probably be like, "Hey, what kind of donuts are you having this week?" <laughs> well, they'd be like, "What kind of alcohol do you put in your coffee?" I'd be like, oh, "I got some fucking." Tanya likes that cinnamon flavored vodka shit. I got some of that in my fucking coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Just whiskey. Awesome. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Phil terrified. says we'll talk. Yo, yeah, well, that's cool. good, man. So yeah, I'm 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 worried about the alcohol. I'm trying to stay away from it now, but you guys keep talking about it. You're making me want to fucking drink. Yeah, hey, man. Like I said, if you're gonna do it, honestly, you know, do it at home. Sort of see how your body reacts to it. Um, and everybody is different. Like I said, I mean, you know, people talk about transfer addiction a lot and things like that. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not a big, I'm not a big believer in the fact that. When we go to these obesity health things, people talk about, oh, there's transfer addiction. There's always somebody that talks about, there's always some speaker about transfer addiction and alcoholism and things like that post-weight loss surgery. And it does happen. Don't get me wrong. It does happen. Um, I think there's a lot of other quote-unquote transfer addictions that happen, um, like shopping and sex or, you know, those different things that people transfer their addictions to. And maybe exercise, which might be a good thing, you know. I'm looking oh. forward to the sex transfer. <laughs> yeah, really? It's still waiting for that to happen, huh? Um, but I'm not a big believer because I sort of read these studies. that There was a recent study that came out about the whole transfer addiction thing. And so basically because and, – and even at support groups and stuff, people are always talking about, you know, be careful about drinking alcohol. That's one of the things they'll warn you about is you know, there's a high rate of transfer addiction. Well, the reality of it is – and, you know – Maybe I shouldn't say this, but the reality of it is it's really a small, very small percentage of people that actually have transfer addiction to alcohol and specifically. Other things, yes. I think shopping is a big one. Um, like I said, uh, exercise, um, other things, sex, whatever you want to call it, sex addiction. Um, I think people that are addicted personalities are going to find some way uh, to, to, to uh, you know, they're, they're going to find a way to... Um, their addiction is going to transfer to something else if it's not if they can't do it to food because we can't do food at this point, at least not in large quantities or the foods we want maybe right. So, um, but as far as specifically alcohol, if you read the study, it's basically it says that they predict because it's not really a, a true study quote unquote because how do you do a study on people whether they're alcoholic or prob problematic drinking I think they call it. It's really not that difficult. It's difficult to do. It's not easy for them to, to get those numbers. So what they do is they interview people, and it's you know they take a you take a survey, right? So they survey people before the surgery, and then they survey people after. Okay. Well, first of all, how many people are are honest about their drinking before surgery? Most people are trying to get approved, or they don't want to tell their doctor that yeah, I'm having three drinks a week or whatever it is, right? So two years later, yeah, they might be honest with with their drinking, but how do we know that you weren't already drinking excessively before surgery, right? So that's one thing. So it's really not, to me, it's not really a super accurate accounting of what happens with as far as transfer addiction. And people are probably going to hate on me and think, oh, it's a real thing I have because I have plenty of people that say, oh, my, my cousin had a bypass and she's alcoholic now or so-and-so. I know so-and-so, you know, a friend of a friend of a friend that's had bariatric surgery and now they're alcoholic. And, yes, it does happen. But the numbers are basically, if you read this study again, Statistically, it says about 2,000 people a year will possibly transfer to problematic drinking or transfer addiction to alcohol, right? Well, how many people a year get bariatric surgery? Well, the current numbers are over 200,000. So 2,000 out of 200,000, that's 1%. Okay, right. so to me, it's not like, oh, my God, 40% of the people, and you'll hear people say 50% increase. 
No, it's not a 50% increase. What it is is the bypass people have a 50% increase over other surgeries of becoming alcohol, alcohol becoming a problem after surgery. And it's only because of the difference in their type of surgery. It's they don't have the pyloric valve, so the alcohol hits them quicker. And so of that 2,000 people, twice as many people that have the bypass are susceptible to transfer addiction to alcohol, which is st still a pretty small percentage. So to me, I think a lot of people place an emphasis on transfer addiction. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I think we'll see people of, you know, like I post on Facebook all the time of myself or my wife drinking or whatever, you know, and a lot of people get, oh, well, see, it's happening to you. And it's like, really? I average maybe one drink a week. You know, to me, that's not alcoholism, you know. No. And people, you know, they just because you see pictures of me on Facebook with a drink in my hand and a fucking donut, doesn't mean I'm doing it every day, you know. And they see, and quite honestly, when a lot of these meetups, because I've gone to them before, there's lots of alcohol involved, lots of drinking, and people are getting drunk, okay. But it's an occasional thing. It's it's a party, you know. It's a, it's a, it's an event, you know. So people, of course, are going to drink. That doesn't mean that all these weight loss surgery people are going to become alcoholic. You know, but yes, it does happen, but it's a small percentage of people. Yeah, I, think yeah, the most like important, I, I think the most important thing that we learned here tonight is that know yourself and moderation. Everything in moderation. A little bit's not going to kill you. And cheers for that. <laughs> and, I, and I need, to, and I want to see, I want to see a show where we got Jim, Phil, and TJ doing a hangout because that shit would be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Now, so, that could be the fucking three bald bariatric boys or some shit. I mean, <laughs> I don't have any hair. Right? Uh, sounds like a plan. I want to just also want to say thanks, Jim, for saving your weekly drink on air for, with us tonight. I appreciate yes, it. Yes. I'm only having one this week. For science. I'm saving two donuts, too, because my wife will fucking string me up by my fucking balls if I don't save her a couple of... By your angry balls. Donuts. Yeah, by my angry balls. So I guess I guess that's going to be a wrap for tonight, right? I think we did, we hit it all. We, we we had joy. We had fun. Absolutely. I think, yeah, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. It looks like everybody had a had a good time. Jennifer uh, has just said, I can't wait to party with WLSers and I, uh, I, I will obesity agree. help. I, I'm going to obesity help. Yes, he'll be at OH as well. Yeah. So come I'll bring on, the fucking Walter. Donuts. Come on, Walter. <laughs> and I'll bring my angry balls. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. I really am gonna try. I want to be this. A angry balls and donuts. I mean, how do you yeah. say no? How could you say exactly. no to that? <laughs> That's great. Well, I just, right. again, I want to thank Jim for coming on, and 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 it's just like Andrew said, you. The, the the clamor for your for your uh, being a guest on shows is just going to be you just take your phone off the hook because it's going to oh. be ringing like crazy. <laughs> um. Anyways, I just want to say thanks, guys. You know, I have a, a lot of respect for you guys. I love your show. Um. I appreciate you letting me come on here and make a fool of myself and drink <laughs> alcohol and eat donuts and shit. Um. I had a great time. Uh. I will be watching you guys in the future and, and, and watching your success because I know you guys are going to be successful, man. I mean, you guys have been doing awesome, and I know you're going to continue to do awesome. So, Thanks, Appreciate Jim. it, Thanks, man. And I, I, I have a feeling we'll, 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 have to, we'll be inviting you back on at some point in the future. Oh, sure. sure. Yeah. Catch me when I'm sober one time. All right. We'll give it a shot. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Walter, uh, how you want to take us out? Sure. It's good to be the Kings. Oh, Something I, like that, right? That is that. Isn't that the old one? That's how it went, right? That's the old one. No, it's hail to the kings. There you